name is Lara, and I am the co-founder and director from The Drawing Arm. And I'm here today with my business partner, Mr. Simon Barrett, fellow co-founder. Hello. Oh, you might have to hold it. Do I, do I? Am I working? Yeah. yeah. Hello. How are you doing? And uh, two of the legends that we represent, um, illustrators Dave Homer and Mr. Ben Brown. Hello. <laughs> so um, the purpose of today's session is just to tell you a little bit about The Drawing Arm, um, what it does, who we represent, why we do what we do, and also to explain a little bit about how it works. And then once I've finished with that, we'll open up the floor to field any questions you have about um, working in the illustration world and commercial illustration, which I'm, I'm hoping you'll... These boys have a wealth of knowledge, so I'm, ho I'm hoping you'll dig deep and ask them okay. some really challenging questions. <laughs> but without um, any further ado, I'm just going to show you a quick clip. Um, which will give you a, a bit of a sense of what the drawing arm is all about. Okay. I need to tune this one. In a nutshell, so um, at the drawing arm, we try to keep it very, very simple. The commercial illustration world is pretty hectic, um, so we try to do the Heinz baked beans thing, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. We represent talent for companies looking to commission illustration. We kept that in mind as a sort of core value for the business when designing and developing the website too. Um, not the, the original one that we launched, but I'll, I'll go into that a bit later. The one we're running now, what, since we've rebranded. Simplicity is absolutely key with this. So obviously we're hoping to inspire um, clients who log onto the website and trawl through all this incredible talent and incredible work. But we also want to make their lives as easy as possible. That's kind of the objective of the business. So who do we represent? Our mix is very broad, and um, when we launched, we had just 22 illustrators. We now have well over 60. Largely Australian talent, but we do represent some international artists as well. And that, the range is very broad, so from street artists and mural artists like Numskull, Bafcat, Beastman, and Mulga, through to vector artists like Saxon Shing, Ash Schmidt, fi even fine artists, Courtney Brims and Shannon Crease. 3D wizards like Ben Fearingly, I always massacre the pronunciation of his surname, and Manifold, and through to our, what we call our sensational all-rounders, of which Ben and Dave definitely are, Jeremy Lord, so a very, very broad skill set, capable of working in Photoshop, Illustrator, and you know, very good at drawing too, which is important. Who do we do it for? So in this day and age, it's pretty unusual for advertising agencies in particular to have in-house illustration talent. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. So they're looking for companies like ours to help solve their illustration needs. Um, and they rely on us to sort of pair them up with the right talent in order to, to get the brief met. So the, these are our clients. We've done work with all of these people. Um, so the big advertising agencies like DDB, MNCs, Imagination and Wonderman, Sometimes um, government bodies like Destination New South Wales, they've come to us direct. Um, and that's starting to happen more and more, actually. Um, some of the big brands are coming to us direct. Dan Murphy's and Guevara, for example. So what's starting to happen now is people are actually sort of, you know, sidestepping the, the agencies and, and coming, coming straight in the back door. Can I say that? I just did. I think you can. Um, so um, some of the boutique design agencies and even PR and media agencies are starting to talk to us now. 
Um, blue chip technology clients are coming to talk to us about commercial illustration. Property development. Yeah, right through to property developers. So that's, that's really trending at the moment. A lot of illustration in property. But the core value behind everything that we do is it doesn't really matter who you are. If you're looking to commission commercial illustration, we want to help you. We want to make that job easy. So I've just cherry-picked um, three or four um, projects um, just to demonstrate the diversity of inquiry that comes to the drawing arm and, and the, the, the difference in, in inquiry and where the inquiry comes from. Um, this project was uh, commissioned from Jack Watts Curry for Hardy's Wine. They requested uh, Ryan Hanrahan to execute these beautiful botanical illustrations to demonstrate all the tasting notes from every single varietal. And this was a really well-received campaign because not only was it practical because it was sort of visually stimulating people's taste buds just by looking at the ad, um, but it, it really, you know, as a key visual, it just popped. It looked really good. It was on all the bus stands and and things. Now, I've picked this one. This was a, the key visual for Lost Paradise, last year's Lost Paradise Festival. I'd love to show you this year's, but they haven't launched it yet. But Mia Tananaka has been booked to create an original painting for both years. And um, the reason why I've picked this one is to demonstrate, as a business, the level of support um, we can give our illustrators. Um, some, some of you may or may not uh, know that Simon and I also own and run the National Grid, which is a strategic thinking and design company. So we can actually offer um, a, a very high level of support to our illustrators. And this, this is a very good example, because Mia is a fine artist. Uh, but Lost Paradise needed a vector for all the commercial iterations of what they needed for the campaign period. So, you know, vectors are great. They keep their integrity. You can blow them up to the size of a billboard or shrink them down to the size of a postage stamp and they look fantastic. So that's, that was the commercial requirement and, and Mia doesn't know how to do vector work. So we um, rather painstakingly digitally remastered this monster piece 45 illustrator layers later. Um, and I just want to quickly show you what I mean about the sort of commercial um, execution of the key visual. Th this is why it had to become a vector, so they could do stuff like this to it. To, um, to launch next year's next too, yeah. and do next year's, great fun. Okay, cool. This, this, was, um, this was a really unusual and lovely project actually, commissioned by, direct from the YMCA. Um, they booked Jeremy Lord to do a series of portraits to celebrate the 10 year anniversary of their bridge project, which was a program created to um, sort of break the cycle of reoffending what they call at-risk youths. Um, and this was quite a sensitive brief in itself because obviously they wanted portraits of the people who had turned their lives around and stopped reoffending or reusing, but they didn't want to. They didn't want them to be too literal because a level of anonymity uh, was was necessary. So I think Jeremy absolutely nailed this brief. And at the um, ten year anniversary, these were blown up large scale and they looked absolutely fantastic. Courtney Brims is another of our fine artists. She's Brisbane based and she does incredible works with graphite. Um, Urban Purveyor came to us um, to ask Courtney to develop a suite of um, pin-up illustrations for their new craft beer range. Um, so from you know the bridge project to craft beer, it's, it's just ne never a dull it's day. Quite, it's quite um, interesting working with um, pencil when you get an illustrate, when you, you start with the idea and then you start sending sketches across to the client and you realise that it, it, it's very hit or miss, so you've got to try and keep them, keep them kind of coming along for the ride. And, you know, ultimately they're going to blow these up to billboards as well, so how you keep pencil to that, kind of get it to that size. We can't vectorise these, so um, they, these were shot 
super high super res, high once, res. once they're complete, but kept completely in, in pencil. So. And they look amazing. So they're on yeah. the beer taps, they're on the packaging, they're on the, the large format signage, um, right down to the, the coasters, and, and they, they've reproduced really well with the type lockups. It's a really nice project, that. And this is also a really nice project. So um, RE, which is an agency in Sydney doing some fantastic work at the moment, they've got Optus as a client. And uh, when they were launching the Yes campaign, the Yes rebrand, they asked for two of our street artists, Bafcat and um, Elliot, sorry, Numskull, um, to do these large format murals, film them, painting it um, live for the, for the retail stores for Optus. The, um, gonna... the mural part is really big at the moment. Oh, it's peaking it's right now. Art. If you're a mural artist or an animator, come and talk to us at the end. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to quickly show you this clip, which Ree very kindly um, gave us permission to show you today. Because it's really nice to see illustrators actually doing what they do. And also awesome animation as well, at the beginning and the end. results were very well received. It looked really cool in situ. Okay, so we, we thought today it might be, it might be, it might not, we don't know, we'll see, of interest um, to you to hear about the drawing arm and how it all came about. So we're going to take you right back to the start very quickly. Um, but as I mentioned before, you know, the double head monster thing, Simon and I, uh, we have a few things on the bubble at the same time. Um, you, you might think that we're based in Surrey Hills along with all the other cool things, but we're not actually. We're based in Brookvale on the northern beaches, neatly nestled between the two brothels on Chard Road. And we have been for over 11 years, and we love it there. Um, but this, the space is cool, and that's why we can't leave. It's a massive, lofty, split-level warehouse. And when we first moved into it, we had this very indulgent studio that was just completely unnecessary. And we, and we just we felt bad. We were like, we've got to do something cool with this space because... Um, it's just such a, a, a cool space. And I'm going back to sort of 2007, 2008, and um, the, the street art movement was really peaking, and um, there were some cracking exhibitions being showcased in Sydney. But you had to, you had to go east side for it. Um, Ambush Gallery were doing some great things, China Heights. Um, oh, really, in Newtown? Are they still there? No. No, OK. So, yeah, if you wanted to see any of this um, awesome street artwork, you, you had to go east. Um, so Simon and I just got chatting one afternoon over a cold VB and a durry probably. We have changed habits since then. Um, and decided that we'd, we'd renovate the downstairs space and make a gallery. And that's exactly what we did. We told people we were going to do it and they came in droves. Every month we hosted an exhibition. We organised beverage sponsorship. Yeah, Shannon Crease was a sellout show. Her work is absolutely beautiful. We still represent Shannon. Um, this is some of her work up on screen now. She is a fine artist, but commercially she's being booked um, for property development work, murals, right through to sort of entrepreneurial um, platforms like business chicks, um, office murals and things like that. We're, so about, she's we're about to um, hand paint 270 metres of hoardings, hoardings for our property development that's going up, which is going to, I think it's going to be really popular. So beautiful way to wrap all of these is to do actual real art. Totally. Building sites are pretty ugly places, but put a, a Shannon Crease collaboration with Numskull in front of it and it starts to look a whole lot better. So um, the other thing that was changing around this time, this is one of Ben's shows actually. Um, do you remember what it's called, Ben? Dead Heroes <laughs> or something? I remember what it was called, didn't we? Dead Idols? Kill your, Kill, your Kill your Idols? Yeah, yeah. This was another sellout show and um, the reason why I wanted to talk about this one, not just because Ben, ben is here, um, but technologies were really um, changing around this time as well, and the affordable art movement was, was kicking off. So originals are lovely. We all want originals. We want to buy and collect originals, but the reality is living in an expensive town, sometimes a limited edition print is, is the only option you've got. And Ben 
properly stepped into this space and smashed it. So Giclée printers were improving, technology was improving, paper substrates were improving. And this whole series of um, portraits was Giclée printed on counts and etching stock, and they looked amazing. And I forget how many you sold that night, Ben, but it was a lot, wasn't it? Still selling. <laughs> Still selling. <laughs> <laughs> um, other technologies were changing. So this uh, on the left um, is a piece from an exhibition we did with Luke Tafe. And he's one of Quicksilver's artists, I think. I don't, I'm not sure he works with him anymore. And uh, Ryan Hayward. And this was the first time that I'd seen photography printed on timber. And then Luke would come over and put some, you know, crazy iconic surf icon from the 70s or 80s over the top of it. And that, that was another sellout show. Ape Seven, you would have seen his work around town. He's everywhere. He exhibited with us. Beastman, anyone know Beastman here? <coughs> For you knowing nods. Um, yeah, he's got tons of work um, and continues to do really amazing commercial work and has actually recently stepped into the uh, homewares space. Um, this was definitely the most bizarre show that we did in the history of hosting exhibitions. Dirty Show in Detroit, it's been going for almost 20 years now, um, to celebrate, it's all erotic art, and to celebrate their 10-year anniversary, they um, wanted to host satellite shows all over the world. So there was one in Japan, there was one in South Africa, there was one in Paris, there was one in London, LA and Detroit. And, and we were extremely surprised and very flattered to be asked to represent Sydney for the erotic show. Might have had something to do with the fact that we're nestled between two brothels, but I don't know. So yeah, it was a very bizarre show. But it was a very bizarre very crowd. Very bizarre crowd. Our biggest crowd to date, that, to date though. I think, like, we had, I think we had about 500 submissions and we had to go through all of the submissions for the show and people's um, perception of erotica is quite interesting. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. That, so we had a live um, airbrush artist painting this girl with the most phenomenal silicon implants I've seen ever, um, live on the night. We, we had a bronze sculpture of a threesome in progress right in the middle of the gallery. Uh, lots of photography and lots of illustration and it was, it was our busiest night. I, we had like well over 1,500 people there that night. It was, it was crazy. Almost too many people for the space. It was nuts. Sex sells. Um, but it was, it was interesting to see how well the group show concept worked. And group shows really started to, to emerge around this time. And this was when we started to see illustrators exhibiting their work as artists. And that kind of really stemmed the initial thinking about starting up the drawing arm. And so on the right-hand side there, Jamie Paul, Beck Winnell, and Karina Zerifos were all artists who were part of one of the group shows that we did, selling limited edition prints, not originals. And um, we now represent them. So we had the idea. We approached just 22 illustrators to start off with, um, most of which had exhibited with us. So we knew them, we liked them, we trusted them. Um, we approached them, they all unanimously said yes, which was fantastic. And we also approached a few people that we really liked and admired, just completely cold, out of the blue. And they also said yes, so we were like, okay, we might be onto something here. Um, and one of the biggest challenges back then was to kind of explain to people exactly what commercial illustration is and where would I see it and, and how does it work. So we made this. So this is obviously the original, this is the branding that we launched with, so. It looks a bit retro these days, but you'll get the idea. It's still nice. Yeah, it's still good.
So that was a really um, effective way to just, well, I suppose educate people. I mean, the guys in the advertising agency know exactly how it works, but there's a ton of other people who, who might think about booking commercial illustrations. There's, so. there's a bit of a transition for us as well because we have, we did run an art gallery, so I think people, the, the perception was that we were still an art gallery, so people, we had loads of inquiries about whether we could sell, whether we could, people could buy prints from us or could buy originals from us, and that was a bit of a transition from us because we kind of went, we're not, we don't, we're not really doing it, we're, we've gone into commercial illustration, so I think that explained it, yeah. it explained what we did to people, which was good. So um, to, to launch the brand, we, um, we threw a party at District 01 Gallery in, in Paddington, just off Oxford Street. And uh, we invited anyone who we thought would be interested in booking commercial illustrations. So all the major advertising agencies were there, um, from art buyers, production managers, executive creative directors, through to talent scouts. We also invited all the sort of heavy hitting editorial and publishing houses, a few boutique agencies. And um, sure enough, they turned out in droves, which was great. And we asked the 22 illustrators that we launched with all to do a 2.7 meter panel that, that really, like we said to the guys, you know, give, them the, give us the best of your words. You know, you've got to blow these people away with your skill and your talent. And what they came back with was just unbelievable. 22 mind-bendingly beautiful panels, just one after the other, adorning the walls of this space. Um, but I think the highlight of this opening launch event, um, well, for me, definitely was having Reg Mombasa um, officially um, launch us. Um, Reg Mombasa, you probably know from the Mambo days, um, but he's an incredible artist. And he, New Year's Eve. Uh, yeah, he's done the New Year's Eve curation, and he's, he's still doing some incredible work. So to, to have him open us and speak and share some of his experiences about the illustration world was a, was a real honor and, and a privilege. And we were sponsored by Hendrix too, which That's was good. nice. <laughs> so, um, the other um, funny thing that I just wanted to, to share with you from the night um, was in order to draw attention to the opening, we, uh, we thought it would be cool to make a life-size tool, like an illustration tool, so that people know, knew what this event was all about. It was about art and about drawing. So we actually uh, approached Pelican, who own um, Sharpie and Artline, and said, look, we want to make this giant eight-foot replica of your Artline pen. Do we have your permission to do so? And not only did they give us permission, they paid for it, which was really nice. Because I think they, they paid for me to drive around Australia with it on the roof of my car as well. Which is quite nice. <laughs> so it was just a random idea, but the um, the upshot was, you know, we had the the, the pen um, wood turned. Uh, we had a local two packer spray it black. We replicated the, the signage vinyl, the graphics, and adhered that to the the side of the pen. We also uh, worked right next to an engineer, so he was able to replicate the clip on the lid for us and build us the stand so that outside the gallery of, of opening night it looked like this pen had sort of descended from heaven and smashed through the concrete. But the reason why I'm sharing this with you and showing you the uh, process shots is this was also when social media was really starting to, to peak. And uh, we posted a few shots of it ahead of the launch and I, just, I love social media for the naysayers and we had all these people going, it was so fake, it's Photoshop and it was just, it was brilliant because um, it was real, so I just wanted to prove to you guys that it is real. So, because we couldn't, we didn't really show any of the process shots anywhere else. So, how does it work? I'll crash through this because I'm, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are already illustrators in the commercial world. Um, so, this is the, the arm officially in, in action. So, step one, obviously, um, the way we've designed and set up the website is we want to inspire people, but nine times out of ten, people have quite a clear idea in their mind what it is that they're looking for. Sometimes they don't know. So it's our job to kind of, we want people to check out the full range of artists that we have, but if they've got reference or a brief in mind and they're, they're looking for a particular style, clients do just send us that and say, look, who would you recommend? Um, we, also, we also redesigned it so that it was very practical for time poor creative directors, art directors, producers, so everyone in ad agencies is on this hyper, hyper, hyper kind of um, vibe all the time where every Friday at quarter to five, I'll get, we'll get a call from some agency going, can you pitching. find someone to work on the weekend, please? <laughs> yeah. And um, so we, we redesigned the site so that it had that super simplicity kind of feel to it. I kind of felt like there's nothing worse when you've been, you've got a brief, and then you're like, you go to a website and you have to sift for hours and hours and you're looking through and you're like, 
what do I, what, who do I Where need? do I go? So, what do I do? So yeah, we super simplified it. It was all about service offering. We're a talent management agency, essentially. You know, we're all illustrators and artists, but we are uh, a talent management agency. So that's what we wanted to do with the, with the new site. And it had to work really well on mobile too, which was one of the reasons why we redesigned and rebranded because, you know, art buyers these days are planning their next day on the bus on the way home on their phone too. So we had to really rethink the way we talk to our clients and customers. So, um, yeah, the, the review and recommend step is, is next. And this is the part where most illustrators heave a huge sigh of relief. Illustrators are notoriously bad at selling themselves. They always underprice themselves. Sometimes they can be disorganized sorting out their own timelines. Um, and they always, always, always undercharge, usually, especially the emerging ones. Like, they'll be doing stuff for free. Don't be doing stuff for free. So this is, this is where we come in. So we go into bat on behalf of the illustrators. We sort out that brief, get it really clear. Um, we'll define the budget. We'll, we'll find out what the end use is and what the artwork specifications are. We'll sort out the timelines and, and we'll lock everything away at this stage. Um, and that's kind of nice, actually, because as an illustrator myself, you know, having price conversation with someone is, is usually the, the awkward part. So if someone else can do that for me, fantastic. And um, our team are really good at doing that. So once we found a match, we kickstart the process. First round, you know, it, that, and that can take any form. Sometimes it's just mood boards and scamps. Other times it's quite complicated sketches or a series of storyboards. Um, refinement is the is the next step. So once we've shown that sort of initial first draft concept round, um, this this is a warning to any artists out there. The commercial illustration world, there will be changes. So. Um, it's pretty, All, ruthless. it's pretty ruthless, you know, and sometimes there's a lot of creative heads trying to nail one particular brief. So you've got to kind of be a little less precious about your own work in the commercial space. It's inevitable. There's a, there, there's a lot of creatives involved. In yeah, the, in especially the with the ad agencies, yeah. which is great because you usually end up with a banging result. Mm. Um, but there's a bit of back and forth. Do any of you remember the game Pong? Oh, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's a bit of that going on. And then ultimately, a fantastic product is delivered. So the common file types handed over, AI, EPS, PSD, PDFs, JPEGs and TIFFs, sometimes um, MP4s and animation files. So it's, it's pretty broad, but this is another area where um, we can actually support the illustrator in making sure that we're supplying exactly the file type at the right size and the right resolution to whoever's asking for it. So if you are an illustrator who doesn't use a computer that much, don't worry about that. You know, if if you're looking for representation, there are teams like ours who will who will help you with that step. So keep it simple. That's what we've tried to do. We've kept it super friendly, um, and the world of stock illustration and stock photography is amazing. Like it's improving on a daily basis, um, but there is still very much a place in this world for custom illustration. So, you know, our phone is still ringing six years later. Um, people do want bespoke illustrations it, still. It's a big, it's, I think it's a big risk, risk for the big brands to jump on. Um, they, need, they need bespoke, they need custom, because if they roll out a campaign that looks identical to the next campaign, it's, it's, it's never a positive. Yeah, thing. they don't want to see themselves everywhere. So there's, um, there's plenty of work in this town for commercial illustration. So how does one go about seeking representation? Um, in the sea of talent, pick me, pick me. So just to put that into perspective, um, the drawing arm fields anywhere between five to 50 inquiries a month for representation. Um, it's a very competitive space and it humbles and blows me away how much incredible talent there is out there in the world. Um, and I'd love to say yes to everybody, but the reality is we, we just can't. Um, and we've one of the core values when we launched the business is that we weren't going to go mass. We wanted to keep our stable really hand-picked um, and we, we've been very discerning over the years and, and turned away some amazing talents. Like, wow, how are we not saying yes to this person? Of often because it, we, we try not to have a conflict of interest or a stable that's too heavy on one thing. We try to keep a good diversity across the board. Normally when we, um, normally when we get a brief... Um, from a, an agency, we'll, we'll put two or three illustrators forward. We have to find obviously the availabilities and budgets and everything. So you can you can have um, quick and premium, 
um, you know, or, or will put forward. Quite, quite often, you know, everyone tries to screw you on price, but they, so you can get the emerging artists. We try, we try to put a, a good sort of um, collection of people forward for it, but we try definitely not to have too many of one style on board at any time. Exactly, and, and that's part of our, our role as um, talent representatives, is, is we've kind of got to have a look at the trends and forecast where the illustration movement's going to go. You know, three years ago it was chalk, everyone was doing chalk, and it's, when's the next chalk artist going to be booked? And then the botanical movement happened, so we have to kind of stay ahead of that curve and try and foresee what's coming trend-wise in illustration and make sure that we have at least two to three people in that category to, to facilitate that need. Um, so we asked Jules actually to put this together. It was quite interesting to hear her, her perspectives because she does a lot of the fielding of representation inquiries. And I said, can you just put together your sort of top five do's and don'ts? I'm just going to quickly share Jules's insights with you. Do your research. This is, this is so true. So knowing a bit about the company that you're applying to and what they're all, all about and who they already represent is quite important because what, exactly what Simon was just saying, you know, if, if we've got 10 vector, vector illustrator specialists in our stable already and that's your thing, you could be the best vector illustrator specialist in the world that you might get a no because that category is being well serviced by the agency if they've chosen to do what we've chosen to do, which is to keep it boutique, keep it capped. You know, we don't say yes to everybody. Um, yeah, and it's always always nice when we get an inquiry if it's addressed to us, like they, they know who we are. So um, we, we all, the drawing arm, we have public profiles, so just look it up, it's polite. Um, keeping it short and simple, I think, is really important because we're, we're extraordinarily busy, obviously, r um, running two businesses, the team are fielding inquiry all the time. There might be 15 projects on the hop at any one moment. Um, so succinct, you know, snappy to the point is great and keeping it relevant too. Um, tailoring the application is, is always nice too. We've had some beautiful um, in, um, inquiries over the years, hand-painted tea towels and you know, beautiful hand-illustrated postcards and, that are actually sent in the post. That's a really nice touch and, and those inquiries always really cut through. It doesn't guarantee you representation, obviously, but um, we, we love receiving those and um, we do always try and respond to everybody. Um, but, but those people um, definitely get a big up because they've gone that extra mile, which is really cool. Stands out, doesn't it? It does, yeah. What also stands out, but not for the right reasons, is the, the blanket email. So we, we had one illustrator who will uh, remain nameless who um, forgot to blind copy all the other agencies she was uh, uh, approaching. And um, it was a very, very blanket, blanket email. Dear sir, pick me. <laughs> Whoever. So here's my website. You know, like, and there was, yeah, it was, it was, and we actually did have a look at her work, and it wasn't bad, but the application just went straight in the bin. It's just like, if you, yeah, so it's a bit lazy. Being professional, this is probably, you know, numero uno. Um, so, of course, we want to see your personality, particularly, you know, the way you interact with us and in your work, but at the end of the day, it's, it's our necks on the line. Like, if a job goes to shit, it's us who have to sort it out. <laughs> Um, because, you know, as an illustrator, you, can't, you kind of um, are yeah, protected <laughs> by us a little bit. Um, so, yeah, keeping things professional. Dave is the ultimate professional, just quietly. Um, so is Ben. Oh, so is Ben, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't be here if they weren't. Um, and also, you know, if you do get a yes, we'd love to represent you, respond, um, preferably within the first three days. You'd be amazed. Sometimes we've said, look, you know, here's a contract, have a read, we'd love to sit down and talk to you. And we've had no response and we're like, oh my God. <laughs> so if I send you a brief on a Friday afternoon and, and you, you know, yay or nay, just tell us if you're interested or not. Um, can I rely on you to respond to, to what I'm telling you? And if you haven't responded to the, the, the initial door opening, then it's a really bad it's, look. It, it's, it's on level par. It really does make up a big percentage of how we represent people. If they don't pick up their phone, you can't work with people. You know, it's very... It, it is very ruthless, like I said before, so it needs to be kind of always available or all, at least at least updating us with availabilities and things. It's very important. And available to say no, too. Like, if yeah. we ring you on a Friday afternoon and it's completely unrealistic and you're getting smashed anyway, just responding to that saying, oh, sounds awesome, but I just can't do it, that's totally fine. It's, it's Our job is to manage everyone's expectations. And if, you're, if, if, peop, if illustrators aren't feeding back to us or communicating with us, it makes our job really to, hard. To give you an example, um, 
last week or the week, week before we got a call on the Tuesday afternoon um, brief would potentially be in Wednesday completion by close of play Thursday 40 illustrations by the same person it was kind of unrealistic um, we pulled it off though no we didn't pull that one off <laughs> Oh. That was a different one. Oh, right. I've got the, another example. That was the have job. Oh, right. No, we, we, but it, it was trying to field that expectation thing because it was very unrealistic to say, can, can we turn it around? But we, you know, we, we were ready for it, but... I know, I can't die. So we're going to stop talking now unless you've got specific questions for us and we're going to invite uh, Ben and Dave up onto the stage. We just picked a couple of um, their projects to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a couple of project, commercial projects that they've done um, w with us, and just just to talk a little bit about their process and and how they work. Um, this was um, through. So when Optus did the original yeah. Yes campaign, so this is pre the Yes campaign that's in existence at the moment. Uh, MNC Saatchi's had the account and they asked us to approach Dave to develop the key visuals for the campaign. Dave, tell us a little bit, little bit about it and your experience. Uh, it was a, is this one? Yep. It was a weird one. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, it was this campaign they had where it was like cats and um, you know all the things that you see in there. And they again, it, it came down a deadline. They had like a minimal amount of time to to produce an image that would reflect the TVC that they were running, but of course they didn't think to shoot stills of the TVC as they were making it. So this was um, like a workaround to to create characters and, and elements that were, were that were being screened on TV at the time that would that would reflect back to this. So it was a it was a weird brief, um, and it was. It, because of the time, we had to cheat a lot. We used a lot of um, stock photos, but painted over the top. So it wasn't photographic. You can't really see it there, but it is, it all, it is all painted um, digitally, of course. But, but and do you use a Wacom tablet to do that, Dave? It's all done on a Wacom, yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, it had to be huge, because this was going on billboards and buses. Yeah, I've actually got um, a render of one of the final executions in a, in a bus stand, so it had to work pretty big. And it's not, it's, not, it's not the style that I would normally do, but um, it's the style that, that they asked for, like the, the project required. Like, it's probably not my favourite illustration style that I've yeah, ever worked on. Yeah, sorry about that, Dave. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine, but it's just that that's, that's, that's the world, I guess, of commercial illustration. You have to separate... My, I mean, my personal artwork is... My paintings and stuff are vastly different to anything I do commercially. Um, but this was a job. They paid really well. They paid on time and you know it, it was great this, um, yeah. I think there's a, there's a whole conversation as well about um, your ability to be diverse or your ability to stick to what you stick to what you do for example I, you know we've got Ben on stage who you know such a such a defined style of what he does and it works beautifully and we have worked on projects with him we have managed to I think bend, bend it a little bit to to make it fit the brief and then on the other side you've got um, Dave who really takes it on board so sort of typographically or this Optus I mean when we got this brief for Optus it was like probably the most bizarre brief we'd ever got yeah. unicycling ninjas and cats playing with disco balls we were like what the 20, fuck are they 20, doing 20, 20 year old art director at MNC <laughs> is actually kind of going yeah I want cats and Lasers and internet trends, and we were like, oh, okay. <laughs> this, this was actually one of the illustrations. I think in the end there was maybe seven, seven or eight. Oh, it's or huge. Eight key visuals, massive yeah. project. That was yeah, one of the, was This is one of the biggest ones we've ever worked on. It. it and it took. It was a good three months. Yeah, it was. Yeah. 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 It was a doozy. Um, so some of Dave's work you might be more for, for familiar with. This is, you know, fairly award-winning stuff. Was um, the cover artwork that he did for Empire of the Sun. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Oh, this is this is great. This is. Um, I've, done, I've worked on two records with Empire now. Um, this was their big one that sort of exploded all around the world. And uh, it started off just with the record label uh, coming to us and saying, we just want a, a, a poster of Nick and Luke. Um, and I did a few test illustrations, just tests, 
and references to a lot of Star Wars old posters, like all the old 80s sort of sci-fi posters. And we sort of realised that it was more than a poster, this could be the entire visual communication for the band. So we, uh, we, we basically just created the entire the visual language of it, I suppose. We got costume directors, um, costume designers, sorry, and, we, and every element of this was illustrated. I had this great idea, I thought at the time of sitting in this meeting in this record label, and I said, why don't we do what like band like the Gorillas do? Like every every image that's released is a hand-drawn illustration instead of a boring old publicity shot. And I, everyone thought that was a great idea, and then I realised, man, that's a lot of illustrations. <laughs> 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 You're like 45 or 50, you know, you get you get magazines like NME in London like requesting a bespoke image for their cover, and it was great professionally because it was work never ended, but it was a lot of work. But um, How, what sort of time? What sort of time were we looking at for that one to complete uh, that one? I mean, start to finish, it was probably a twelve-month project with all those illustrations. But for the album cover, it was probably a month from brief to finish, um, and it was pretty hectic because we had to get the costumes designed and um, and then photograph them. I photographed them in my studio just with my iPhone and then painted them. <laughs> Um, and then obviously put all the other elements in. But um, the second album <laughs> Sorry, go was, was fraught with difficulty. Um, Pitfalls, tell us them. Always good. The, <laughs> the, some of the guys in the band had learned how to use Photoshop very basically. <laughs> 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 oh, never a good thing. And I was living in New York at the time and one of them was living in LA and one of them was living in London. So I'd wake up in the morning, and, and the record label's in Sydney, and I'd get all these Photoshop files of what the bands decided that they want to do, and they were just like fairies and you know trunks and just really strange stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was it was late, a late night thoughts. Late yeah, night thoughts yeah. indeed. One, one of the reasons why we love working with Dave is, is he really is a thinker. So a brief will come in and he'll not only understand it and, and con concept what, what it is that, are, that they're asking for, but it'll, he'll also go the extra mile, as he did with, with this project, and th really think about what, where else could we take this? How far can we push this? Where, where, can we, where can we do with it to make it really cut through and stand out? So if you've got that in your skill set, in that you can, you can take a brief, really get inside it, and bring your ideas to the table, I guarantee you know, the people commissioning it will be interested to hear what you have to say. You know, if, you're, if you're making a creative agency look better, you'll do well. And, and Dave does very well because he's a, he's a very good thinker and has some awesome suggestions. And you know, he's easy on the eye. <laughs> um, this, this is a project for um, Patron. Do you want to talk a little bit about this one, Dave? Oh, you've done one of these as well. I have, actually. Yeah, yeah. They're both getting flown to Mexico, by the way. This is yeah, very not, unfair. This, this, quite this, unfair, this is one of, the, one, of the, one of the rare perks that, yeah, we're, we're going to Mexico to, um, to, paint, hey. to paint at the Hacienda, in the, which is the original Patron factory. In Jalesco, yes. I think they do, they do limited edition tins every now and then, and they're hoping to, to fly all the art. This is all around the world as well, so I mean, to organise this, whoever's having to organise it, good luck to them coordinating 15 or 18 artists from That's all right, over the yeah. world who have done the limited edition tins to meet up at this hacienda, um, get a tour of the facilities, all expenses paid. We have to knock out painting while we're there. That's the fun part. And then from what I can gather, I think that's all going to be auctioned off for charity or I something. I think so, yeah. yeah. And it's going to be another, another tin. Another tin, eventually. Yeah. This big sort of collab tin of all the artists who've contributed to these limited editions, which is a really cool gig. I'm just having flashbacks to our Christmas party. Oh yeah, my God! Don't drink too much of that stuff in one go. They sent us four bottles to say thank you. I haven't got one yet. Oh what? No, we don't, you we got don't a have tasty one too. <laughs> yeah, we finished ours in one night. Really bad move. I woke up with a black eye. Yeah, this was Sel self-inflicted on the dance floor. On my own. This was supposed to be a representation of Australian nightlife, and it's sold in like duty-free stores, so it's tourists coming. So it was. It tended to be. They like, didn't send you one. No, because I dealt, I dealt with the American... Yeah, oh, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. So Damn. I need to... Uh, maybe we can talk... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Because they were limited edition. Um, I, went, I, I flew in Australia last, last week and, and they all sold out. I went to the duty free to Yeah, damn. Popular, I'm yeah. not surprised. They're beautiful. And the, the finished tins are really gorgeous. Like they're proper, proper collector's items. 
Mr. Ben Brown, sitting very comfortably currently. Um, so Ben was one of the original um, artists we approached at launch. Um, we've, we've always been a massive fan of, of Ben's work. And um, Ben, we call Ben an all-rounder as well because he is capable of, of other styles. I mean, a lot of people come to us, case in point, this project here was a restaurant in... The Rocks. The Rocks called... Uh, El, El Camino. El Camino. And they were obviously big fans of Ben's work as well, and they, they commissioned um, this series of illustrations for their restaurant. Do you want to tell us a bit about it, Ben? Yeah. Um, they wanted to refit the restaurant. Um, it was a Mexican sort of restaurant <coughs> vibe, and they I'd done the, some of the series that we showed before, which they liked, which you can see reflected there. So... They bought a bunch of those prints, which was good, and then they had they'd done a lot of photography and just had that basic idea. So they supplied the photographs and I put the illustration over them and then they, they were just fitted in, in into the, the wall spaces. And As large format vinyls? Yeah, I yeah. think so. I actually never yeah, well, got there to have a look myself. <laughs> ben, tell us a bit about your process. Are you a tablet user as well or do you draw with a ho <laughs> hockey a puck? Or? I, use, I like tablets. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I've always liked drawing on paper. The, the, it, I, I'm still a little split between the two. In the last year, perhaps, I um, have started using a Wacom board more. Um, I'm starting to lean that way. I do like having a, a finished piece of art or drawing, particularly if the way that I work is normally quite sort of line-based artwork and things like that. So I like to have a finished piece of paper and things and put it in the flat file, nice old school and things like that. But um, I am leaning more towards using digital tablets these days particularly the Wacom one, because you can really... Uh, yesterday I was working on a piece that's A1 size, but, you know, I was just talking before about how I was sitting in front of the TV late last night and you can just go in so close to do detail and still keep working later than, you know, staying at work in the studio or working at home or whatever on a table. It frees you up that way and just the, the sharpness you can get. I work in Vector, so I actually draw everything and then trace it through Illustrator. So I think, um, so yeah. So when you, when you are putting a photograph with illustration, mm -hmm. you were doing that in Illustrator? Or were you, you able to draw over the top? No, of? no, no. I, 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 I pretty much, probably with these I would have done them on a light box because that was probably a year ago or yeah, something exactly. like Yeah, exactly. Technology's that. changed again, hasn't yeah. it, since then? So now, if I was to get this brief now, I would take the photos, um, open them in Photoshop, open your new layer, and then sketch over the top. And then Amazing. sometimes I do go back and forth. Like, I might print that out, output it at A3 or A2, and draw in pen to get that feel, because it's important to retain that feel. I don't... I guess my work has a sort of loose look that I want to retain to make it look like a drawing and still have its own identity and not look like a super polished piece of vector art that you might see on a, um, you know, a website or something like that. So I'll go back and forth between the two, really, and then, um, yeah, just sort of do the finished thing. And, and again, like we were saying before about the vector thing, is that as these were large and when you're doing event things and advertising... Vector art's so manageable in that you can email layered files, files to people where they can pick it apart. Other, lots of other people are going to work on your piece that you've done and it can be blown up as big as this wall here or larger and it can also just be shrunk down there and retain all its integrity, which mm. is, you know... Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's a benefit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just, just to, um, this is another project that um, ben, Ben's not a particular fan of, but we loved it. And this is just to show you his breadth of capability. So uh, Well Farm, I think the agency was called Ward 6, um, commissioned, they really liked Ben's work, but they, they asked him to sort of push the style envelope and, you know, get outside the comfort zone a little bit. They, no skulls. No skulls. Yeah, no skulls. <laughs> um, so I think... You've it's it's <laughs> like one in some way. It's on her arm. Underneath one of the shirts, she's got a skull. Tell us a little bit about this project, Ben. Um, this was, yeah, this was different to do because, again, it was like you were talking before about meeting the brief. There was about 40 illustrations um, with the budget 
there's a time constraint for everyone, you've got to deliver it on time. But also for you as an illustrator, you want to, you have a budget to work for, it's no use to spend like a month or six weeks on it if, you know, you're going to earn less the longer you take. So you need to turn it around fairly quickly, especially when there's a, a lot of illustration. So I think these were actually for... It was, for, it was a farming product, so yeah, it was quite a bizarre product. job. It was like a... The, the idea is that you're killing whatever pests you're killing on the farm, I think. So, and, and it's obviously got that <laughs> Sailor Jerry vibe, which was in the brief. Um, so, yeah, it was just turning around a whole bunch of illustrations pretty quick to a... It wasn't a million miles from what I'm comfortable with, when, you know, to do something that looked like a Sailor Jerry thing. But, again... They just had to be turned around. Look, to me, they look quite simple, but I guess they were going to be quite small probably when they were on the packaging or whatever. But, yeah, it was a funny job to work on, considering that it was probably aimed at farmers. I'm <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> farmers well, that <laughs> like drinking Sailor Jerry, maybe. I'm not <laughs> yeah. sure. Queensland? Yeah. 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 Is that, is that, uh, that exactly? I think that's I think that's actually yeah, photoshopped, that, think that, that one, is, yeah. yeah, because we wanted to get that. Um, sort of, yeah, airbrushy feel on it. Which, if you had more time, you probably could do with Vector, but I need to yeah. turn it around quick. Yeah, sometimes yeah. The quick and dirty is the, yeah. the way it goes. Um, so, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, the illustration process can be and should be very collaborative, that, and that, that's kind of what we're all about, just producing work that we're all en enormously proud of. Um, so we've, we've got about 20 odd minutes um, left. We'd really love to hear from you guys. Have you, have you, are there any questions in the audience at this stage? Because I've got a few if, uh, <laughs> yes, excellent. Can we have a, a spare microwave for this? I can talk loud. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I'm just wondering, um, Dave, you're saying like, <laughs> when, I say, when I say lunch, it was probably a lunch from start to finish. So they would call, I don't know, on a Tuesday, we'd have a meeting on a Wednesday, and they'd say we need to see a, an idea or <coughs> three ideas by the end of the week. And then and then it's a process of going back and forth. There's always changes, there's always, especially in music, which is quite unique because you've got artists, managers, and record labels to deal with. Um, so that was probably a month from start to finish, but in reality, it's like, can I see something tomorrow at one o'clock? Do you know what I mean? Um, so it's always quite quick. And it's not a project that I would work on solidly for a month. I've got other projects in that you're working on while you're waiting for approvals and stuff. So you're always juggling like a handful of stuff, a handful of different projects at once. Mm. Um, Dave is actually a full-time illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the juggling act would be particularly prevalent for him. Um, some of our illustrators are um, work full time as graphic artists or animators within the industry. Um, so the, the, the Friday, Friday afternoon brief that Simon was telling you about before that invariably lands for some crazy pitch that needs to be knocked out over the weekend sometimes really suits an illustrator that works full time because the weekend is the only time that they have to really execute the work. Um, but just to um, support your question, th this is where we can really help out because if someone comes to the table with a bullshit timeline, um, we're the ones who'll go in and call bullshit. So um, sometimes we win the battle, sometimes we don't. But um, you know, if we, we try to keep things simple and we try to minimise stress. So if the shit's really hitting the fan and the artist is unhappy, we're, we're there for you to go into bat and defend your honour. <laughs> Which is really great. I've, I've worked on a few projects, um, one for uh, like a, a telecommunications company, and I think I called you, or it might have been when Alex was mm. there, um, we'd worked like six days in a row on this project, like 15 hours a day. Um, I think it was storyboarding or something, which I don't usually do, so I was flying blind anyhow. But um, we had to work a 24-hour stretch at one point, and I called Lara at like might have been Alex, like three o'clock in the morning, going, I just can't <laughs> do this anymore. Um, and, and they take over that, which is, you know. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll go into that. And, and I mean, e equally, um, 
On some rare occasions, sometimes when the deadline is looming and the illustrator's struggling, we, we've actually been known in the past to sort of step in yeah. and help too. We did a monster billboard campaign for Yellowtail Wines back in the days with one of our illustrators who was doing an amazing job, but time was running out. And, um, you know, those print deadlines, those media deadlines had been booked some time ago. So um, not that the client knew this. I hope the client's not in the room. But we actually all hopped on the tools um, and helped Edwina out. <laughs> and uh, we got there in the end. So, you know, it's best to communicate with us. Oh, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. We're like, yes, yes, you are. We will help you. So uh, we try to be as supportive as we can across both sides of the table. We support our illustrators and, and we'll support our clients by making sure that their expectations um, and deadlines are met. Any other questions? Yes, one in the front here. Yeah. Um, specialist seems pretty straightforward as to how you can present that work. Being a hybrid seems much harder to sort of showcase that work. I wondered if you could speak a bit more about um, what you're looking for. If it's a medium hybrid, or if it's like style hybrids, and how you might go about speaking to that. It's it's a very good question actually. And if anyone um, down the back didn't hear it, um, she was asking basically, you know, if you've got a particular style that you want to showcase you know how do you demonstrate on your profile the versatility and other styles that you might be c capable of might, um, is that a yeah. fair enough interpretation yeah well it's a funny one um the it, the advertising industry specifically is very trend based so you watch trends come and go and and i think our job our job is to try and go okay this is what's going to be next 3d type's going to go mental um for a while stills i think 3d stills um still life objects kind of they're gonna just go crazy in the ad world you can do a lot with that at the moment so um you they take hero of place so your object your object becomes hero but it's still art so you kind of you can do quite a lot with that so our job in a way is to go okay that's gonna happen and in an ideal situation that's the illustrator's job as well is to go I can do that. I can totally. do typography. I mean, we, you know, we've Dave. Dave's been working in in the, more and more into typography kind of style, and we've been kind of pushing him. There's a huge demand for typography. It, you know, it says what it does. It, it it it's a good way of communicating message. So, in a way, it's if you do believe that you've got that skill and of, of diversity, then it's the it's the ability to kind of go, okay, I'm good at typography. Here's some typo typography. I'm good at, um, you know, just flat vector. I'm good at aerial vector. I'm good at, you know, it's, it, I think it's just trying to be, pick your best. Yeah, and share your best with us. Totally. Because what, what we'll do with your profile, with your, the, the artists who do really well at the drawing arm are the ones who continually share their work with us, commercial and otherwise. So um, we'll update your profile according to what we think needs to be sitting at the top. Um, but we're also customizing proposals all the time. So we might have 100 images of yours and only 20 on the website, and we might shuffle those around as we see different trends coming and going. But if something, if an inquiry comes in and we know that you're capable of that style, but that particular image isn't hosted currently on your profile page, we'll send them a bespoke custom designed PDF that talks about you and your style and showcases your capability in that area. So, yeah, the, the artists that do really well with that might choose to put their signature style up on the website, but bear in mind we're also in the, in the background putting people forward for jobs. So, in that case, I won't say, go and have a look at Dave Homer's um, online profile. Um, I'll send you a PDF showing you what else he can do, and we'll actually cherry-pick relevant images to demonstrate that that brief can be met. We had, because, sorry. We had quite an interesting... Dave and I had an interesting conversation a few months ago about um, uh, Dave's wrecked in the States by Wine... That's it, Bernstein and Julie. <laughs> and most and unmemorable Dave, you tell thing. the story. It was interesting. It was about, um, it was about the portfolio. Yeah, when I, 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 I've been with Bernstein and Julie in, in the US for about 14 years now. And to get, to get them to sign me, I went to... Um, I just went on a three-month tourist visa and just lived in New York and basically took every single meeting that anyone would let me have. Um, and I took my iPad around with 
uh, or my laptop or whatever it was with my portfolio on it, and I had everything that I've ever done. Not everything I've ever done, but every piece that I liked on there. And every single time I'd be talking to an art buyer or a producer or a creative director, and they'd go, yeah, your work's, your work's great, but I don't know what to do with you. And I'd be like, well, I don't know, you know what do you mean? And they're saying, well, if, if an art director comes to me and says, I, I want something like the guy that does the work with the red pencil or something. Which happens a lot. It so does we, a lot. When, when a brief arrives in our studio, <laughs> there's always a reference to someone. You know, you've yeah. got Jean Julian, you've got Para, you've got all of these people, and, and that's kind of how the agencies will pull the brief together. So yeah, and then they, and then yeah, and then they, exactly, and they said, um, you know, if, if that comes in, I'm going to go to that guy. I'm yeah. not going to go to the guy that does everything. One guy told me that my portfolio was great, but schizophrenic because it was just all over. <laughs> and it, when it was. Um, anyhow, long story short, I, f I finally got, through all those meetings, I got a meeting with Bernstein and Andrulli and um, signed with them, but we had to pare my portfolio down, right down, and even over the last three years, I've pared it. Yep. My, my personal website is much different. It, it still has a variety of styles, but I'm focused on what I, what I want to do and what's, what's working for me at the moment, so it, that, and yeah. that's, it's much and that's more cohesive, it, but it shows that I can do other styles about different segments of that website. It, I think it's about making, like, you can't make fish climb tree. Yeah, don't make the fish climb the tree. No, <laughs> but you can't, you can't, I mean, you can, there's a set, there's a level of diversity and there's a level of, there's that point, but I think you can't, if you're not good at something, don't put it in your portfolio, because if you get asked to do it, then you'll fuck it up, probably, and yeah. then that whole... Which thing. I've done, I, I yeah, yeah, the storyboard asked once, and it didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> we've got, uh, one of, we've got one of our, um, one of our artists, uh, really good mates with Ben, but he, um, he's, a, oh, he's such a beautiful guy, but he's like a proper kind of recluse, you know, you, you right. don't, yeah. Yeah, 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 you don't want Marty yeah. going out of his four walls. You'd never put him in front of a client. So you ask him, <laughs> we asked him one day if he would do live art, and he was like, oh, no. no. <laughs> Straight away. Actually, Simon just reminded uh, me to tell you about um, another uh, service offering of the drawing arm that we, we launched probably close to three years ago. Um, graphic facilitation and live drawing is really starting to ramp up now. So what, what I mean by that is the big corporates like Deloitte and Microsoft regularly host workshops and, and forums where ideas, sometimes very complicated ideas, are being um, discussed. And they'll hire one of our live illustrators to actually scribe up on the wall as they're discussing and workshopping an idea. Um, and there's, there's a fair amount of scientific evidence uh, behind the reason for doing this now because what you commit to memory um, that you see visually is so much higher than what you hear or what you read. Um, but other things started to happen within those workshops in that having that left side of the brain creative person at the back, um, Thomas Jackson in particular actually started contributing to the workshops mm. and he was coming at it from a completely you know, creative perspective and they're like, damn, we never would have landed that idea. So um, the, the graphic facilitation space is, is blowing up. So if you have that in your skill set, we might not um, host your profile on our pub uh, client facing website, but we've got, we keep all of those people's details on file because it's a very different skill set. So the people who can stand up and draw live in front of a room full of people, their illustration work might actually be weak and not, not stand up in the commercial world, but what they can do live, it, not many people can do that, so they're just as valuable. We did, um, we did get a phone call one day from um, one of the biggest uh, insurance companies in the world that we'd done one of these facilitations with, and they, um, <laughs> they asked if the artist might have been stoned. And uh, they sent us some photos of what had happened in that room. And uh, I wasn't really sure how I felt about this whole experience. It was actually like looking at someone's stoned brain. And this is like very, very corporate, senior corporate kind of stuff. So it was, anyway, that was the end of that. Yeah, so going back to being professional, please don't turn up stoned if you're booked for a live gig. Well, you know, you can, but do nice work while you're looking out of one eye. <laughs> Um, ben, I've got a question for you, um, if, if you wouldn't mind, because I've always wanted to know, and then I'll throw it back out to the floor. Um, I'd love to know how you got started in the illustration world. I always just loved drawing since I was a little kid, and um, I think I started working in screen printing um, factories in Brookvale, just around the corner from yeah, you guys. If you, if you can't get it done in Brookvale, go to <laughs> and, Melbourne. And, uh, 
I think I got into um, music. I started doing some some bits of work, bits and pieces of work for surf companies and things. But really, the main thing was with music around sort of the time that bands like Nirvana and that broke, and probably when David was starting too. And I just started drawing handbills and posters for things for fun. It wasn't I didn't have designs on thinking those would be you know, getting me into a job as an illustrator, I probably thought more... I did want to be an illustrator, but I thought more in terms of trying to enter in a more traditional sort of way, but it was actually by doing something I really loved and then getting... And then it was right time, right place, that sort of whole scene turned into Nirvana and those bands of the 90s. So I started doing posters and record covers and things like that and moved from, you know, grimy pubs, I guess, into record companies like David and things like that and just... That probably got me going and then I started doing, you know, editorial work for magazines when that was still around and... Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot of T-shirts and things, a lot of... Uh, I always have worked, still do, still love... I've always loved T-shirts as well. I love music, T-shirts, skateboarding, surfing, pop culture, things that you live with, within. I think it's important that... You've got to love what, what you do. Um, some people can apply themselves to anything. With, uh, like <coughs> we were saying before, I probably don't have a really broad skill set. I work within the sorts of worlds I exist in and I find it easy to do and I love it so I can sort of execute that sort of thing. Whereas if I was to do something like an insurance job or something I think I'd be jumping <laughs> off in the deep end so I, I think yeah that's it. a, it's an important point is that you've got to love what you're doing to really perform well and, and meet the briefs and really smash it yeah. Yeah. yeah good any more questions from the audience yes this gentleman here the oddest medium you've used, oddest medium you've used. Play, anyone play. yeah uh, chats I've used um like I've built a little, uh, built a little swamp out of a, a, a <laughs> bunch of random shit that I found on the street, and then uh, photographed it. Oh, we got some little trees from a craft shop and stuff, and then uh, smoked some really cheap cigars and blew it across the swamp to make it all swampy, and photographed it with the, with the swamp, cheap cigars. Nice. Cheap Insta cigars swamp. on a Monday morning. That was a tough day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> with a whiskey. <laughs> ben, weirdest medium? I, I can't think actually. I, the, again, I, you know, I, I'm pretty limited. <laughs> just, <laughs> just really traditional sorts of uh, drawing tools. Really, I'm trying to think now. I'll probably remember some weird thing in half an hour's time, but not really. Pretty much stick to thing. I did see on that show we were talking about earlier last night. The Wanderers. The, they had the guy working in. I think it was Roan's thing, and they had the guy working in sand that was from Vanuatu or something. That was amazing. Mm. He was so technical and geometric, but could draw in sand, which amazing. was incredible. I found that really interesting. But no, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty much a uh, pens and paper and now tablet kind of guy. <laughs> so Simon's probably very well versed to answer this one, actually, because um, I've seen him blow up giant flower bombs and also yeah. create the giant spinning wheel of doom in the middle of a we field a, in New we, Zealand. We took a, a wooden sheep dressed as a... No, a wooden wolf dressed as a sheep to New Zealand. We, fo we were photographing this wolf in sheep's clothing and we got that to um, customs and, and at duty free and they're like, oh, you brought your wife! <laughs> <laughs> they unpacked the whole sheep. We had to explain the... We had no idea what we were doing, to be honest. It was... Trying to trying to get some uh, trying to get some good shots out of it. So th that particular sculpture was made out of plywood, though. But the end result was this amazing photograph of this wolf in sheep's clothing amongst a whole ton of sheep in a beautiful New Zealand paddock. We and built um, we built a spinning wheel. When your Mac dies, we actually built one and we got it. We found this weird welding workshop in the middle of New Zealand and we got them to weld us a stand. And we had this motor that ran this die-cut piece of polystyrene then realised that the rainbow doesn't move, so that was another bit. And then you can stick it in the ground with a beautiful landscape behind you and then switch the thing on and go and film it so you had these, like, real backgrounds and then you'd film it as if it, was, as if it had crashed. 
So we did that the for... The world had crashed. Yeah, we did that for a couple of weeks. That was kind of fun. It was really bizarre. So I could, I, I haven't, I've got the videos of... A lot of Simon's projects have no commercial purpose whatsoever. <laughs> well, a couple <laughs> of them, <didn't> <laughs> <laughs> But that's where lots of cool work comes from. Absolutely. Yeah. You've got to keep up your own yeah, um, ideas and visions because... Um, like I said, a lot of creatives are actually looking for inspiration. They, they've got a problem to solve, and they're like, fuck, oh, someone's got to help me solve this. And they'll see something that an illustrator has done or an idea that an illustrator's had and gone, there it is, I can, I can work with that. So it's important to, to maintain your own portfolio as well. I'd say that too. A lot of the work I do is I do my own stuff and then get a brief. And you can, you've already got it. That your record you collection, before. yeah. So you even fake it and pretend you've done some rough drawing. Like <laughs> <laughs> so finish work there and then submit it. And it's like, yes, that's what we were after. So again, yeah, just working on your own, your own ideas, will it pays off. Yeah. If I if I've got a spare day or more books for a day, I'll just do a drawing and then yeah. it, it, and if I like it, it goes on the website or on Instagram and then. I'm working on a project at the moment for National Geographic that came about that just from a little doodle that I did on an off day. Mm. Um, I think that's where you get to, you're not working for a brief, so you get to explore Play. other ideas. Yeah, out. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Any other queries? Up the back there. Um, yeah. yeah, so the question was, if you are an emerging illustrator and just establishing your style, um, how, how do you get noticed? How do you sort of cut through the, um, the, the talent and how do, how do you get noticed? Um, it's a very good question. Um, and I think um, the, the new generation of illustrators um, emerging today are actually blessed and cursed at the same time. You guys are very much blessed in the tools available to you, not just the new technologies, but things like Instagram and Pinterest and all, all the social channels. The, you know, the opportunity to show the world your wares is so easy these days. You don't need to spend a fortune having someone build your website or do what we did and work out how to use WordPress and see if we could do our own. But yeah, you do have to market yourself. So. Um, Building your own kind of profile is, is a lot easier, um, but the curse, the, the downside of that is because it is easier, there's a ton of it around and trying to you know, cut, cut through or be noticed through you know, a plethora of talent is, is one of the hardest things. I think, I think um, just working at your game as well, you know, d depending on, I had, I had a conversation with someone the other day who put a really beautiful application into, um, the drawing on, they went to the trouble to, to put the application in, but they weren't there yet. It just felt like they weren't there yet. But they would probably get there, but they just kind of, I don't know, there was just something about it that I felt that it would be a disservice in a way to, to rep them because I was probably going to have to hold their hand through the experience or, or I was going to get rapped from the ad agencies because it wasn't right. And I was like, well, I could, but... So I had the conversation, I, I spoke to them and said, look, you're just going to keep pushing it because they, they were doing murals, but they'd only done one mural kind of thing. And, and it was like, go do 10, go do, you know, do free stuff, not exploiting do free, free stuff. stuff. No, no, I'm not saying, <laughs> no, I'm not saying sell your soul, but you know, like if you, you know, do a mural on the weekend. I, I, I think doing like, not so much doing free stuff, but like I was saying, getting involved with, things where you can showcase your work, where it might have been music for me, it could be something completely different for you, but to showcase your work. And also, also Instagram in itself is probably the best form of social media for everyone yeah, that's the to best use gallery as in an the world. illustrator. And yeah. think about what you're putting on. Don't overdo it. Don't keep putting everything, everything, everything up there. Put only good content onto Instagram so that it, it looks good and makes people notice. And... And like you said, if you've got your own style, make sure it looks different than other things because people will find it and stuff. And, and the time of day, don't, if you've done something you love, don't put it up on Tuesday night at one o'clock in the morning because you just finished it there. Wait until Friday afternoon at four o'clock or something, you mm -hmm. know, when everyone's going home or having a drink and just flicking through. That's when they'll see it and when it'll get good traction and things like that. 
Yeah, that's really good advice, actually, Ben. And, and bear in mind that you, your Instagram account is, is your gallery, so curate it, polish it, make it relevant, and um, you know, show your personality and demonstrate your wares, but make it, make it as beautiful as you can. Yeah, Lady just, up the just, back uh, Sorry, just one, one second, just come back to that. The other thing you can do that I'm actually doing at the moment is um, if, there's some if there's a company that you like or a, or a band that you like, um, this is not working for free, but you do an image for them and just email it to them or, yeah. or copy them on Instagram. You're not giving it away for free. Like, I'm working on a little project in my spare time at the moment with this watch company in Detroit that I really like, really respect what they do. So I'm working on a little illustration for them. I'm going to send it to them. Chances are I'll never hear back from them. But if they, but if they, they do hear, if they do get back to me, then we can talk about getting paid and, and or working on something else. It's, it's, just, it's just getting people to notice you and, and remember who you are. That's it. I think uh, just one other thing as well. It's about being, like, we, I was talking to someone else about this the other day when Jean Julian put up that uh, peace thing, the Paris peace sign. It went completely viral. That didn't even just go nearly viral. That was probably the most viral thing of but last year or the year before. And he didn't do that for any other reason other than it was his own personal feelings. And, you know, that was not a commercial piece of work, but it went tropo. And that then elevated him into further in his career and I think further in his um, profile. So I think it's just being current as well. You know, have a think about what's around. And, yeah. all, all three of these boys have brilliant Instagram accounts, actually. So if you want to see an example of, of what to do with your Instagram space, um, check them I out. Don't, I don't have any followers, so I just appreciate <laughs> So at, at Simon Barrett, <laughs> at Mental Ben, and at Dave Homer Draws, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Laura no, don't look at mine because you'll just see hundreds of pictures of my children. Yeah. Seriously, <laughs> I don't put any of my own work up there. It's just my my babies. Um, lady up the back, please go for it. Yeah, we call this one the blank canvas, and it's a very good question. Um, so the, the lady is just asking us, you know, what, what do you do when someone knows that they, they need to commission something, but they're not exactly sure what or how or where? Um, th we, we actually love these challenges because we actually sort of get involved with the creative process with, with the marketing manager, whoever it might be, who's going, seriously, my boss has asked me to pull something off, and I, I'm out of my depth here. Um, talk to us because, you know, even if you don't know what you want, we can help you... Mm. One of the best things that the drawing arm does, actually, is write a good brief. So you could come to us with as flailing an idea as possible, and, and we'll solidify that and reverse brief it to you to say, this is what we think you need. These illustrators would smash it. That's how much it's going to cost. There's also the tire kicker. That there is the tire kicker. Yeah. So, yeah. So <laughs> you just have to ward them off gently the by, kicker. by kicking them back. Um, but, yeah. I, it's funny, when a, when a project does come in, it gets really exciting. I love what, when a brief comes in because you, you have to use, you know, because quite often it's like, oh, I've never even thought about that. I've never seen anything like that before. But then all of a sudden, all of these, obviously we've got thousands of images from our illustrators and you start to think, well, they could do that. They could totally do that. And it's trying to then push, push it to the client and say, okay, you might not have thought of this, but it, it's quite a diverse kind of way of doing it, but here's the way we could approach it so yeah so even if you're not sure what you want it's always worth just getting in touch because we, we've got a team of people at the ready to to help you get there yeah that's part of our job any other queries questions i've got one more actually <laughs> <laughs> i had lots actually um i'm gonna send this one to dave who would be so actually you've kind of already answered it with the detroit watch thing um, but who would be your, your dream client? What, what would a dream gig look like for you, just so I can go out there and make it happen for you? Yeah. Um, I guess, I guess the, 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 I'll just go back, refer to the watch. The watch company is just a watch company called Shinola, and um, they started, they noticed that they, they're from Detroit, uh, and Detroit is in dire straits at the moment um, because the auto industry is finished. So they uh, they've decided to build 
like beautiful watches and beautiful bicycles and just really beautiful things and they do it all in Detroit and they're trying to bring companies back and bring, a, bring an economy back to the city. Um, so that, like that's just a company that I just have mad props for for doing stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so companies like that, and I, I don't know how to contact them other than their Instagram account, um, but I'm just working on this piece that I want to send them and say. That's amazing. But that doesn't always work. I just did one for Hurley as well. I know you do a lot of work for Hurley, mm -hmm. um, and I've never worked in the surf industry, and I never heard back from them. But yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. all right. That happens. I think that's yeah. We could have told you that, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's fine because that's just another little piece that I like that that I've got now, and you know, I just take the Hurley logo off and. Actually, and Dave <laughs> raises a good point. Like, there's no such thing as a wasted exercise either. Um, you know, sometimes a job does go tits up, and we have to introduce what we call in the industry a kill fee, where the illustrator still gets paid for their time, but the job doesn't go anywhere. Um, in in our world at the National Grid, that happens all the time. We, you know, we're pitching two, three creative concepts in one go. One, only one ever gets up, and you know, there's all these these poor little really good ideas that just you know didn't go anywhere it's never a waste like every time you go through that experience um, even if it is applying to an illustration agency even just getting your cover letter or your portfolio to a place where you're happy to share that with someone if they turn around and say no don't ever take it to heart because just going through that exercise you've learned something you're in a better place than you were before you did it and there will be someone who will represent you. I, I honestly believe that. I think there's someone out there for everyone in this world. There's a ton of commercial work being commissioned all over the world. And with the, you know, the power of the internet, it's actually possible to, to work from anywhere in the world for anyone anywhere in the world, which is mostly, mostly. kind of work. It can work and, and, it, and it can backfire. Yeah. Um, I'll give you uh, one story. Um, so we represent uh, an illustrator in Germany. This is a case where it works really, really well. So when you've got a, um, a talent on the other side of the world, it creates what we call the 24-hour studio effect, where illustrators working timeline through the night, agency gets first draft, has the data, talk about it, arrange feedback and feedback, and then by, you know, by the time artist has woken up in the morning, he's waking up to feedback and he's ready to go again. And you get this pretty amazing 24-hour experience, whereas if they were in Australia, obviously we're all asleep at night, so nothing's happening overnight. Um, and that can work extraordinarily well because the agency's like, damn, that was quick. You know, you guys are working all night. Yeah, he's in Germany, it's daytime over there. Oh yeah, of course. Um, but obviously that can also backfire. We need an immediate change and this is not gonna go to print as it is artist is in Germany asleep, not answering his mobile. Shit, what do you do? So this, this is another reason why, you know, we, we do try and offer that level of support um, because if the shit hits the fan, you know, nine times out of ten, we can fix it. Going back to the um, dream client, dream project thing, a, a good mate of mine was the head of innovation design at um, Adidas and then moved to Nike after that. And he um, commissioned he commissioned two illustrators out of Paris who are pretty famous and um, they, um, they basically said to him that they, they wanted a one-off pattern for a, a concept jacket that was going to be shown at a trade show in Berlin and it was going to be I think they were going to maybe use a hundred of these jackets anyway the illustrators came back and went sure that's great uh, 250 grand please and um, they paid so <laughs> they got 250k for for a one-off pattern, which I thought was quite interesting. Yeah. So. Do we work on some of those? Yeah, no, totally. I was like, <laughs> Seriously, that <laughs> afternoon we spent the whole afternoon <laughs> manifesting <laughs> that to, to, for history to repeat itself. Yes, far away. That's a very good, good question. question, actually. A very good question. Um, I think the. Um, Shall I answer? Yes. Your answer might be different to mine. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, we're constantly, the, the industry is constantly evolving. And I mean, design, photography, illustration, you know, is constantly evolving. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of companies where everything, like the, 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 the dollars just fall out of it. And we kind of, when we set the drawing arm up, we said, you know, like, bespoke illustration, custom illustration, it's integral because Ad agencies don't have illustrators on board. They do sometimes. They've got great designers. They've got um, 
they've got the ability to do it. But if you look at the model of an ad agency, it's it's reduced, and then when a job comes in, you know, you pull the team. It, it's just the nature of the beast. So, um, in answer to your question, I think I mean looking at animation and looking at um, the way that kind of is, is moving, that's going to play a big part in it. Um, but I, I think I just truly think when we when we set this up, there was all of the shit was going on in the design world with 99 designs, and you know we, we lost as the national grid, we lost a whole chunk of our um, business. So we knew it was kind of happening because it was the, all the small to medium enterprises, you know, the people that, the plumbers, the guys like that, that, they don't give a shit, you know, they want a logo, they want a nice logo, but they don't, they're not going to spend 20k on it, they'll, they're, so that whole chunk of the industry just kind of went, whoosh, gone, overseas, like, farm it out for as cheap as possible. Yeah. And when we set this up, we thought that we're not going to, we're not going to bombard it, we're not going to, um, we're not going to undercut the illustrators, we're going to respect the illustration for what it is, and I think that, I hope, that that stands us instead to future-proof ourselves slightly, that agencies, ca major above-the-line campaigns that are costing lots of money will always need bespoke work. And I think to try and translate that over, not necessarily overseas, that's not the right thing to say, but, but it's always going to be there. So I'm kind of hoping in five to ten years we'll still be around. <laughs> T totally. And I, I think that that's another part of our job too, is to actually predict what's, what's happening in the illustration space to keep us relevant. So, for example, um, fintech, in fact, any, any tech system as a, a software platform or app that's currently in development at the moment, um, which there are a ton of, and, and some of them are extremely lucrative. You know, there are, there are app companies being bought for astronomical wads of money. But with anybody trying to bring anything new into the um, commercial market, if it's not been done before, it needs explanation. So we kind of, we were doing a project at, at, at the National Grid for one of these um, software as a service platforms and um, we suddenly thought you know we're going to have to explain all this so we did a whole suite of vector explanations to, to kind of demystify what this fabulous new product was going to do for people and there's going to be so much of that in the next five to ten years if you're an animator seriously get in touch um, because um, all these new platforms are going to need explaining. Z Zero did it brilliantly um, so they, they made a ton of um, animations to explain how to use their software. Um, and I think the more that those sort of new tech SASs get up, the, the more that will be required in the commercial or, um, world. So. Or we'll represent 60 robots. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And we'll give them all a name and we'll give them a personality and we'll build a website and then they can decide what the illustration is going to look like. Just, just from a... Um... <laughs> you can have Fred, he's awesome. Just quickly, from a, from a business perspective, though, I think what we've built at the drawing arm is, is actually um, extremely licensable. Like the, the, what we've developed over the last six years in terms of IP and systems and documentation and the website itself, which we custom built from, from, from scratch, um, I think is, is extremely licensable. So I, I could see us dropping this in Tokyo tomorrow and it would work. You know, there, there is creative talent all over the world. So anywhere where commercial illustration is being commissioned, I think I think the business would survive. We just we just haven't we, we wanna nail Sydney first. You know, we've got we've got some amazing clients and some amazing illustrators and the phone's still ringing. So we'll keep doing what we're doing for as long as we can and enjoy the ride. I think that's us folks. Yeah, I think that's it. And we're on time as well. So yeah, thank you.